welcome back to Give It A Grow. Today we're going to be looking at the most iconic mushrooms in the world, the Amanita muscaria. They're commonly known as fly amanita, or fly agaric. And they used to be used as insecticide to kill flies. That's because these are poisonous. They contain a neurotoxin, which makes them deadly to insects, but it also makes them hallucinogenic. Because of their striking appearance and hallucinogenic properties, these are the iconic magic mushroom, or fairy tale toadstool. They can be seen in popular culture as the Mario mushroom, or the mushrooms in the Smurfs. They're even right on the cover of our field guide, which calls them a colorful but poisonous mushroom. These ones growing in Minnesota are a variant or a subspecies of the fly amanita. And instead of that iconic red cap, ours have more of a yellow or orange color. These are a classic cap and stem mushroom, but this is just the fruiting body of the mushroom. A lot of it is actually underground. If we go down to the base of the mushroom, you can see a white fuzz growing. And these spread underground in a vast network of thread-like mycorrhizae fungi known as hyphae. And they act essentially like roots of a plant. That web of hyphae will feed on dead and rotting organic material. Those mycorrhizal networks even form symbiotic relationships with trees. The plants will photosynthesize sunlight into simple sugars, which can be exchanged with the mushrooms for moisture and nutrients. Eventually, when these mushrooms die, their nutrients go back into the soil, which helps feed those plants. And when these plants die, all that rotting vegetation will in turn feed the mushrooms. That's why you'll often see mushrooms on or near rotting logs and stumps. Mushrooms thrive in shady, moist environments. So you're more likely to find them after a rain or near a lake like we are here today. The fruiting body of the mushroom starts its life as a little bulb, almost like an egg. And as the cap grows and expands, it will eventually release the veil underneath. That veil protects the gills as they form. And it's the gills that release the spores, which are very much like seeds, although they're more similar in size to pollen. They're almost like dust or smoke. The veil will often leave behind a ring about halfway up the stem, which is another iconic structure of these cap and stem mushrooms. They have long off-white gills that go all the way from the stem to the edge of the cap, with some shorter gills mixed in, and the spores are also an off-white. Fly amanita are instantly recognizable. But another tool in identifying mushrooms is making a spore print. So you take the cap and you leave it over a sheet of paper, or white or black, depending on the color. But we might even be able to see them if we just wipe underneath here. And you can see a very faint kind of white dust. And that's how these mushrooms reproduce. They release their spores and they drift in the wind and travel all over the world. This mushroom just fell over naturally. And I would ask that you don't pick mushrooms unless you are going to eat them. So there might actually be a natural spore print under here. Those could be some spores there, but they're so small, they're basically microscopic. One of these spore prints probably has millions of spores.
They're usually about the size of your hand, although they can be smaller or much larger. Look at the size of this beast. <laughs> it's huge. Or this big behemoth. It's about twice the size of all the others. This orange and yellow cap variety is native to North America here, often grows in the eastern United States, but can grow as far north as Alaska. The red cap variety are native to northern Eurasia, where they've historically been used for their hallucinogenic effects, notably by Siberian shaman and potentially by Vikings to enter a berserker rage. They may have even been used by Native American shaman to go on a sort of spiritual journey. The neurotoxins in fly amanita are water soluble, so they can be boiled or cooked away, making them technically edible, but I still would not recommend you eat them. The mushrooms appear in late summer and early autumn, and although they're not extremely rare, they're also not extremely common. So to find a group this abundant is really spectacular. I was so happy to share this with you today. If you enjoyed the video, let me know in the comments or with a thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.